Hello, and welcome to another Climate Tech Podcast, conversations with the people trying to save us from ourselves. Today's conversation is with vegan entrepreneur, Paul Bevan, founder of the cultivated meat company, Magic Valley. I reached Paul in Melbourne to talk about the limits and possibilities of cultivated meat, why he transitioned from activist to entrepreneur, and why he's not his company's target customer. I'm Ryan Grant Little. Thanks for being here. Paul, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Ryan. Thanks for having me on. Pleasure to chat. Tell us a little bit about Magic Valley's mission and product. You obviously won me over because I'm an investor and have been for about a year and a half. What's Magic Valley about? Yeah, thanks, Ryan. I certainly appreciate your, your your support as one of our earliest investors and, and all the help that you've been throughout throughout that 18 months. Yeah, so look, Magic Valley is really an extension of my personal mission, which is for me to remove animals from the supply chain. And the way we're doing that at Magic Valley is through cellular agriculture. So we're developing cultivated meat products, which are real meat products that are developed without the need for any animal slaughter at all. So this is real meat. It's not a. It's not like plant based. It's not a fermentation. It's actually real, real meat. Where Where does it come from? How do you make it? I think there's a special team member named Lucy. Maybe you could talk about her. Yes, absolutely. So. It is, it is a real meat product, um, what we're creating, as you mentioned. So it, it's not a plant-based substitute. It, it's not precision fermentation. It's it's real meat. And so how we developed that or how we have developed that, particularly with our first product, was by taking a small sample of cells from a living animal. So in, in our instance, from Lucy the lamb. So Lucy was a newborn lamb and we took some skin scrapings um, from Lucy's ear. Lucy has gone on to live her full and natural life. She's now a sheep. She's not a lamb anymore, living in the paddock uh, with her flock. What we've done then with those with those skin cells is take them into the lab and convert them into stem cells. And we convert them into a particular type of stem cell called an induced pluripotent stem cell. Now, that type of stem cell, we can then direct to become any cell or tissue type in the body. So it can become muscle, it can become fat, it can become bone, blood, connective tissue, whatever we direct it to become. For our purposes, it's primarily muscle and fat that we're creating. And so we will grow those cells up in the lab by adding nutrients to those cells to get them to grow just as they would inside Lucy's body normally or any animal's body normally. So things like uh, amino acids, glucose, et cetera and grow those cells up. So we grow up the the muscle and fat. We then combine them together to create a real meat product. So it is molecularly identical to a traditionally produced meat product, but we have some advantages also from doing that within the lab. So we can actually tailor the nutritional profile of those products. So we can add in additional protein content, for example. We could add in particular vitamins and minerals, B12, for example, we could add in omega-3s, and we can also reduce some of the the less desirable components, such as saturated fat. And so that's basically it from beginning to end. At the moment, we're creating uh, what we would call an unstructured uh, product for our first products. So if you think of like a ground meat product, or we would call it a minced meat product here in Australia. So we have that muscle and fat grown up. It literally goes through a mincer to, to, to make a minced meat product. And, and what you can put that into or, or what we have put that into are things like tortellini or dumplings. It could go into sausages, pies, burgers we've created, tacos, uh, all of those sorts of unstructured meat products. You say it's undesirable products like saturated fat. That may be so from a nutritional perspective, but from a taste perspective, saturated fat can sure be great. And it's a struggle that some of the, the plant-based alternatives have had in order to try to uh, replicate the mouthfeel or the taste or the satisfaction that comes from from animal fat. So I think that that's a real advantage also for for cultivated meat. Absolutely. Yeah. So we don't eliminate it completely, but probably just lower the levels. And it's obviously a balance between finding that, as you mentioned, the the, the taste, the texture, the mouthfeel, even the aroma uh, in particular. Well, when we're talking about lamb, um, definitely, but for, for all meats, really. Just recently, Impossible Foods came out with a, was Impossible or Beyond came out with a one-third pound burger, and it's supposed to be much less healthy, much higher fat. And there are a few people in the industry who are calling for less nutritious 
products that taste, you know, taste really great and looking for something that that advertises the cardiologist not approved and tons of salt and tons of fats to compete with, you know, cheeseburgers and, and bacon and things like this that um, that were, you know, people are not necessarily eating for health benefits. So we don't have to try to beat them in this industry, both on taste and on, on health at, at the same time. But so that's interesting with cultivated, you can basically tailor the nutrition profile and you could also make, you know, an artery stopper if you wanted to and thinking of like a very delicious lamb vindaloo greasy lamb vindaloo or something like that with with lots of fat in it absolutely and i think it depends on the the market as well ryan so we do have the ability to to tailor the 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 nutritional profile of the product so we could make a you know a really high protein you know low fat version for you know the gym junkies for example and we could make uh you know a really higher fat example just a, just as you spoke about then for just for purely for for taste purposes and for for people that are interested in that and i think it changes demographically as well we've been having conversations um with a number of the larger retailers uh here in australia who've really highlighted the importance which flies in the face of what you were just saying but the important the importance of the nutritional profile and the health profile of the end product because what they express to us is that you know they've got a lot of consumers that are buying the the, the plant-based substitutes and, and the plant-based products but some of them are, are quite put off by the the lengthy list of um, ingredients and the amount of processing that that goes into those plant-based substitute products so they are healthier in some ways and potentially you know less healthy in other ways and so, so what's been highlighted to us is you know the importance of the health profile of the end product so i mean it really is you know obviously market and, and demographic dependent Maybe I'm just exposing my own bias where my <laughs> my idea of uh, plant-based diets mostly revolves around French fries in, in different forms. <laughs> you, you talked about these being kind of unstructured products. So ground meats, uh, uh, that type of thing that you can use as a dumpling filler or, or, um, or you know, in spaghetti and pasta and, and that type of thing. Is that because when you gr- when you're growing cells or you're cr- creating cultivated meat, it doesn't come, you're not recreating the animal itself. And so you, we don't have the familiar cuts of meat, like ribs and T-bones and, and that type of thing. Is that a challenge for the industry? Yes, it, it definitely will be. So a lot of people ask us that question just around how does the process work? We get a lot of questions around, you know, are you growing a whole animal? You know, what is actually going on in the lab? You're growing a whole leg. Can you, you know, grow body? It's like, what is going on? But we're not doing any of that. We're, we're growing up the, the the components, as it were, separately. In the future, yes, look, to, to get to, to whole cuts will require really more structure for the cells to attach to. So if you think of, you know, what you just mentioned, like in terms of ribs and things like that with bone, there's obviously, you know, there's the bone, there's the muscle, there's the fat, you know, there's the uh, vascularity running through that. And so it's a lot more complex. It's a lot more complex structure. At the moment, uh, we focus on the unstructured products just because technically it's 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 easier to create those Creating the the whole cuts will require a, a lot more work, just industry wide. It's going to be a great technical or, or scientific achievement from a but from a commercial perspective, I think bone free is actually what consumers want. And so the middle step between that is is probably um, what we would refer to as strips or or, or chunks of meat, which would require things like, you know, the fat running through it, the muscle fibers in the correct direction, things like that, before we get to, you know, a fully formed steak or or, or chop, for example, which will be, you know, a bit further down the line. It's it's all absolutely doable, but I think that'll be the progression just from a, a, a technical perspective. I would like to have my own uh, chicken wing cultivated meat line that just makes chicken wing after chicken wing and in mm-hmm. hot sauce, but that's probably farther out in the future. Or maybe that's a 3D printing uh, <laughs> solution in the in the future. You mentioned that you took a scraping from Lucy. That means that, uh, that Lucy is still alive, as you mentioned. Most companies in the sector use fetal bovine serum to grow their cells. What does that mean? And why is it important that you don't do that? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. And it's a little bit of a perplexing question to me as to why companies are using fetal bovine serum still. But just to to describe, I guess, what, what fetal bovine serum is, it, it is as it, as it sounds. So it is blood, uh, the serum. So so blood from 
the fetuses of pregnant cows when they go through the animal agriculture slaughter process. And so that blood is then taken and has been traditionally used in in tissue engineering and in in cell biology to to get cells to grow basically obviously that that blood or that serum has a lot of the nutrients that are required to enable cell growth and so it has typically been used for that in terms of what we're trying to do though in terms of developing you know cultivated meat products it really is there's a number of issues with it. So obviously there's an there's an ethical issue in terms of using fetal bovine serum because it involves you know the the death of an animal or, or multiple animals uh, to be able to obtain that. So in terms of our mission of you know looking to remove animals from the supply chain, it doesn't make sense to be killing animals while creating products that you're telling people that don't involve any any animal slaughter. So creating real meat products but still having slaughter. You know, doesn't align with our with our values or with our mission, and so there's an ethical issue issue around using fetal bovine serum. So outside of that, there are a number of other issues. So there's there's a scalability issue. So you can't create more fetal bovine serum without slaughtering more pregnant cows, and, and that obviously is just impractical given the challenges that we're facing in terms of you know the climate, the planet, sustainability, not to mention animal ethics. There's also uh, a price issue as well. There's a lot more demand now, obviously, developing this industry. So um, from a commercialization perspective, it doesn't make sense to use fetal bovine serum either. There's also a batching issue. So there's a lot of batch-to-batch variability. Obviously, you're taking blood from lots of different animals. Um, You can't guarantee consistency of that. And that then gives you a regulatory issue. So if you get a a product approved by the regulators and then you need to change the inputs to that or the process of that, that gives you a massive issue because you've got to go back and, and go through all of that again. So Fetal bovine serum, it's it's really just a hangover from you know a different industry or an old way of doing things. I think there's a little bit of, without wanting to offend anyone, there's a little bit of laziness around it, or people continuing to use it. There's no foresight, and there's you know potentially you know a lack of ability there as well because you do have to find a replacement. You've got to find plant-based or synthetic substitutes to get your cells to 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 grow to proliferate and, and expand so yeah so look there's 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 a there's a, there's a lot of issues around um, fetal bovine serum we've never used it our cells have, have never seen it which is a, which is another benefit i guess uh, the companies using fetal bovine serum then have to adapt their cells off fetal bovine serum onto another type of media we don't have any of those issues because you know, as i said we we've, we've never used it so yeah aside from the ethical issues with fetal bovine serum yeah there's a host of other issues so yeah it's definitely one to avoid you mentioned the topic of cost, which is also some, something very important to this industry right now. And I remember 10 years ago, in 2013, I think it was, that Mark Post, who was a pioneer in the cultivated meat world, rolled out the first cultivated hamburger, which uh, was a Whopper, <laughs> I guess, at 200,000 euros. And so I'm guessing that we're not at that price level anymore, but we're probably not at parity with slaughtered meat. What? What what is the roadmap to? Is there a roadmap to parity, or what does it look like right now uh, in terms of pricing? Yeah, it's a it's a really interesting question. I think it depends on the type of technology that you're using. So obviously, not every cultivated meat company uses um, the same type of technology. When we set out to build the company, we knew we had to produce a scalable solution and one that could compete on price because there was no point us, you know, duplicating, as you said, what what Mark had produced, you know, an expensive burger that can only be made in the lab because that's not going to have any impact whatsoever. So we needed to be able to, you know, mass produce a product and do it at a price point that would be you know, affordable for mainstream consumers. And so there's been a lot of uh, advancements in the area in terms of the technology, but in also driving costs down. I don't think price parity is as much of a stretch as, as most people think it is. 
there's been a lot of efforts put in uh, industry-wide and internally for us as well about driving down the input costs. And the biggest input costs are the media costs, which typically FBS has, has formed a, a component of. So for us not using FBS, it reduces our, our costs dramatically already. Uh, and then finding substitutes and you know the, the amounts of um, each input that you have into that media and driving, and driving those costs down. So driving the media costs down is, is super important. We're down to around ten dollars a liter at the moment uh, in terms of media cost, which then enables us to produce, you know, a much cheaper end product. So, for us to produce a, a burger, for example, it depends on also the the composition of that product as well. But and when I say the composition, I mean you know the amount of cultivated meat material uh, and the potentially the amount of of plant based material in that product as well, which does provide some, you know structure yeah exactly, exactly. exactly. I, I i more and more you know i'm invested in cultivated in fermentation and in plant-based and more and more i see some level of convergence where the you know the ideal products might be a mix of two or three of those things yeah it's it's really interesting because when i first started out with the company i thought it was going to have to be you know 100 percent cultivated material to be able to to replicate you know what you would experience you know with a, you know, a traditionally produced product you know a lamb mince for, for example what, what we've discovered and i think most companies across the industry have discovered is that to get the you know the the flavor and the aroma and all of the things that you get from uh, a traditionally farmed meat product that you don't get in a plant-based substitute, it probably doesn't actually require that much. The percentage is probably you know much much lower. And so, where we're at in terms of say producing a a, a lamb burger, depending on the the percentage of the cultivated material, what the what the plant-based material we use is, and the percentage of that. At the moment, now where we're at, we'd be between sort of. Three and three dollars and twenty dollars to create that burger, which I think is a lot cheaper than most people expect it to be. the The bigger shocker is that we're still we're still in a in a small lab facility. Once we get into our our pilot facility, where we're producing much larger quantities, we're ordering much larger quantities, and the, the economies of scale we get through using the induced pluripotent stem cell technology, where we can create any cell or tissue type from that one master cell bank, we'll be able to get that cost down to between one and $5 for, for, for a burger. And so price parity or below price parity really isn't, isn't that far away. And I think it's a, a lot closer and a bit of a shock to, to most people when I tell them that. It would especially be closer if we looked at the full costing of what meat actually costs, and, you know, stripped away the subsidies and, and these types of things that are involved and, and have been kind of uh, entrenched in the in the traditional meat industry for a very long time. You mentioned scale as uh, an issue and, and talked about kind of going from from lab scale and, and growing. Is there are there challenges both for you but for the cultivated industry in general in in reaching this larger scale? I'm thinking about you know pressure vessels or all you know all all kinds of like the bricks and mortar aspect of it. Yeah, there's been a number of challenges industry wide. You know, probably over the last twelve to to eighteen months because a lot of the consumables that 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 we use. So if you think of um, you know, science equipment, you know, you know, pipettes and all of those sorts of things, even bioreactors, tubes, all of those sorts of things was all directed towards vaccine production. And right. there was just like right. no supply available, which was a real, was a real problem. But that, that, that is, there is an issue there as well in terms of scale up availability of bioreactors. So a bioreactor is basically what we grow the cells in. And so the, the larger the bioreactor, obviously the more cells you can grow, the more mass you can produce. And we're still in quite small scale bioreactors. And so the larger scale bioreactors can be either single use or, or, or multiple use. So the single use usually involves you know, a plastic bag or, or container and then the stainless steel or glass vessels are you know continuous use where you would just you know maintain those, those vessels and continue to to use them ongoing and so the production of those so the manufacturing of those even for you know smaller scale you know 200 liter 
sized bioreactors. The lead time for those is, is still sort of you know around six months in terms of you know getting those in the door. There's not a lot of them lying around. And, and that's because they haven't been used and they haven't been needed by the you know regenerative medicine industry, which is which is really where they come from. So all of you know tissue engineering is is coming from that industry. And so there hasn't been that demand for them. There is a huge demand now, though, because there's so many, you know, cultivated meat companies. There are some startups working on, you know, bioreactor development, but typically you're purchasing from, you know, the larger pharmaceutical companies. And then that introduces some some other uh, increased costs as well, because they're all produced at pharma grade level for, for pharmaceutical applications. Whereas what we're doing is food grade. Obviously, we're not, you know, injecting a medication into somebody, you know, where we're producing a food product to, to, to be eaten. And so there's different gradings with that. And so it's kind of a whole new new field. So the, the technology is already there, uh, but things could be done more efficiently and at lower costs. And it's just, uh, it's quite capital intensive, as you can imagine, to produce those bioreactors, not necessarily the materials them, themselves, but it's really the, the controllers that, you know, control, you know, inputs and monitoring of, you know, what's going on inside those reactors. So that's probably the, the, the biggest challenge, I, I would say, industry-wide in terms of scale-up. So getting into those larger bioreactors and then obviously, you know, making sure your processes transfer across so you know what you're doing in a in a 20 liter vessel monitoring you know that you're getting the 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 same reactions and the cells are behaving the same in a 200 or 2000 or 20000 liter reactor so um, for us that's um the next challenge for us to 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 scale up and i think that would apply industry wide as well that's a really good overview of the product and and the production itself. What does the market look like? So I know we hear a lot about Singapore, where you could basically go into a restaurant and order cultivated meat. Uh, you hear it mentioned as part of the uh, kind of environmental or um, you know f- feeding masses of people problem in in places like China and also the Biden administration is talking about it as well. What does the state of regulation look like globally? When can this be on plates at in in homes and in restaurants globally? Yeah, look, I'll probably start with uh, close to home first. So, so here in Australia, we we don't have any products approved, as you mentioned. The the only approved product uh, is in Singapore at the moment, but we've got an existing framework here in Australia called the the Novel Food Pathway, which we will go through with the regulatory approval and for our products. That's a that's around a nine month approval timeframe. And that's a, a statutory timeframe. So you have to get a, an outcome in that timeframe, which we'll be looking to, to enter into in the second half of, of this year with our products. So we're hopeful here in Australia, we'll have uh, products available commercially uh, by the end of next year, the end of 2024. Outside of that, the US is probably the most advanced outside of, of Singapore. They've provided FDA approvals to two products, to my knowledge, uh, both again are chicken chicken nugget products from two different uh, companies uh, in the US, and they're now awaiting USDA approval. So they've got two bodies overseeing uh, the the regulatory approval of cultivated meat. Uh, everyone has their their fingers crossed that that will be soon and and uh, and hopefully this year, uh, which I think obviously you know the US is a huge market, and so that will I think open up. Um, uh, possibilities for for companies industry wide, and a lot of the the regulatory authorities, you know, take their guidance, you know, from what the FDA and the USDA um, does as well. So I know the regulators uh, there talk to the regulators in Singapore, talk to the regulators in Australia and in Canada as well, and they're trying to to streamline um, the, the the regulatory guidelines so companies are able to. Get products approved in in multiple jurisdictions without too much difference between the regulations. Europe seems to unfortunately be a bit of a problem with regulatory approval of just new products in general, let alone food products or, or novel food products like this. Some companies I know within the industry are also using genetic modification as well as part of their process. So I think that presents them with an additional hurdle as well. We don't use genetic modification in our process for a number of reasons, but regulatory approval is one of them. You know, con- consumer acceptance is another. But yeah, so throughout throughout Asia, it's a little bit difficult to know what's happening in China, but I think they'll take their lead as well from what gets implemented by the FDA and, and USDA in terms of regulations as well. It's specifically mentioned in the five-year plan that I think came out a, a year and a half ago or so. So that's that's a positive sign, at least. And in Australia, generally, so that's kind of the regulatory side. <laughs> the, maybe the most famous 
a cultivated food company there is Vow, which is making meatballs from the extinct woolly mammoth and, and is obviously catches headlines. And I saw them a couple of weeks ago at, at Food Hack in, in Switzerland. What, what does the market look like beyond that, just in food tech in general in Australia? There's actually a lot happening here in Australia in the in the food tech space. Uh, as you as you know, Ryan, we've got a uh, a, a food hack chapter uh, here in Melbourne as well, and we recently had a had a first meetup uh, here where we had forty or forty or fifty people attend. And there's a lot of there's, there's really a lot happening. There's a lot of great ideas. There's a lot of great startups and lots of great talent as well. Not just in cultivated meat, where you mentioned there's there's two companies uh, here in Australia, but precision fermentation, there's a there's a lot of plant-based companies here as well, producing lots and lots of different products. There's lots of people working on sustainable alternatives, not just within food, but also, you know, clothing and other goods as well. And there's lots of people looking to actually move into the industry, either from, you know, academia or other industries and a huge amount of interest from recent graduates and university students as well. So that younger demographic is hugely attracted to the food tech space. Look, I would get with you know with without doubt you know seven to ten inquiries a week from people looking for jobs, and we're just you know one small company with within Australia. So look, there's a lot of people with a lot of talent across a number of different areas uh, in the food tech space. We've got lots of cell biologists uh, here in Australia, bioprocess engineers, lots of people with a lot of experience as well, you know, from that life sciences or regenerative medicine industry. Uh, and a lot of them come to us because they're, they're looking to have more of an impact with the work they're doing. They, they want to be doing more meaningful work and see tangible outcomes from, from what they're doing. And so I think people just in, in general, you know, are, are looking for that. You know, a lot has changed, you know, particularly throughout COVID where, you know, people are reassessing, you know, what they're doing, their lifestyle, what contribution they want to have, what's meaningful in, in their lives. And obviously, Work is a huge, a huge part of that, and so there's definitely, yeah, there's definitely a lot of a lot happening in in the food tech space here. We're lucky as a country; we've got a lot of, you know, produce that that we produce here, and there's a lot of tech happening in that space. So, yeah, definitely a lot happening in Australia. That's great news, and especially that you get to kind of play a role both as ambassador there in Melbourne for Food Food Hack, but also talking to university students and telling your story because you've got quite an interesting story as well. You're an, an entrepreneur kind of in the health space by background or the fitness space, but you've been vegan and plant-based for, for quite a long time. And you came from kind of a more activism and politics background in, in this. And now, now you're in business. How has that shift been? And, and how, do, how do you feel your impact has changed in, 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 in that sense? Yeah, it's a it's a really interesting one. I get asked about my my background a lot because a lot of people, you know, I guess want to make want to make a shift from you know what they're currently doing to you know to to running a startup or to working on something that's that's meaningful to them and a lot of them look to me for the for the answers you know what's that what's that silver bullet unfortunately there isn't a silver bullet it's a, it's a, it's a lot of hard work but i guess you know as you mentioned you know i i do have a you know a, a business a background so so that side of things is is quite familiar to me. I have previously done quite a lot of you know vegan and, and animal rights activism uh, and also uh, was involved in, in in politics previously. And I guess the the frustrating thing for me was the the amount of impact I was having you know with with my activism or how slowly things moved through you know politics, the political system, law reform and, and all those sorts of things. So I feel I have a lot more control over the the outcome and a, a greater ability to to drive change through a commercial enterprise, as opposed to you know politics or, or activism, which you know is really around centers around you know arguing with people, convincing people of your point of view, getting them to to change their mind or or to change their behaviour. You know whether it's you know, eat, eating habits or you know wh whatever the case may be. Enacting change through politics is is really stifled by the system itself. There's a lot of vested interests as well. And so for me, being able to create a product that you know benefits the consumer 
without them having to change any of their behaviors has a really immediate impact and, and a long-term impact. It enables me to you know, achieve my goals in terms of my mission. It benefits animals, obviously. It benefits the planet and it benefits future generations. And so for me, for, for, for my personality and, and my skill set, you know, being able to enact change through you know, a commercial enterprise just sits with me you know, a, a lot better than you know, the impact that I felt I was personally having through through activism and, and politics. And, and that's not to say they're not both important and do have an impact, but just for, for me, my skill set, my personality, being able to, you know, do what I'm doing now makes a lot more sense. You'll surely be a hero to many of the up, up and coming food techies in Australia. Who is your hero? That's a that's a really great question, Ryan. And I'm going to disappoint you by saying I don't have any heroes. There's there's no there's no heroes in my life. I feel like I'm I'm pretty much blazing my my own path. And, and as many people in you know in this industry are, I do have a lot of business people I do look up to though. And one of them that a lot of people have heard of, but a lot of people haven't heard of. So it's always a bit hit and miss. But Gary Vaynerchuk, from a, a business perspective, is, is someone that I do look up to, particularly for his ability to, to do business with, with kindness. And I think that's that's really important, not just in everyday life, but particularly in business, which a lot of people view as, you know, very cutthroat and those sorts of things. I think being kind in, in life in general, but but also in business is, is super important. And uh, yeah, he's someone that I would look up to. And where would people know him from? And so otherwise known as as Gary V, he's a he's a very uh, has a very large uh, social media presence. So Gary V, so Gary G A R Y V. Most of his social handles are V double E. But uh, he's a you know a self made entrepreneur. Uh, has built up multiple multi million dollar uh, businesses. He's based in based in the US now. Puts out a lot of free content, more free content than than anyone I've ever seen. And and it's mostly around uh, a lot of it's around marketing, you know, digital marketing, marketing your business, branding your business. But a lot of the content is also around you know how to do business, you know, being being a good person in in, in general, you know, how to treat you know your uh, employees, the people that you're working with, just just life in general and a lot of mo- motivational content as as well yeah you know, around impact and what you can can do through business so yeah i think i've i think i've given him a, a big enough pump up there <laughs> and paul if people want to get in touch with you ask you questions if investors want to reach out what's the best way to reach you the best way to to reach us obviously you know the business uh, magic valley is is via the website so you know magicvalley.com.au best place to reach me is probably on linkedin i'm pretty easy to to find there we try and put out quite a lot of content as well through our magic valley linkedin page but i also through my uh, personal profile on linkedin we put out you know what we're doing um, what's happening at magic valley any progress that we're making behind the scenes um, and people that we're talking to um, throughout the industry so that would be the best place. Paul, thanks a lot for joining. Awesome. Great to chat, Ryan. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to another Climate Tech Podcast. Please take five seconds to send this episode link to a colleague or friend who you think might be interested. Reach out to me anytime at hello at climatetechpod.com. As you could probably tell, this episode was produced, edited, directed, stage managed, boom operated, and everything else by me. Subscribe to hear many more conversations still to come with the world's real climate tech heroes.